You are now listening to Mark's Unexplained World by Mark the Medium from Hinkley Community Radio, a non-profit podcast radio station. Tonight's episode is about that old hag called sleep paralysis. Over to you, Mark. Between 8% to 50% of the general population experience sleep paralysis at some point during their lives. With about 5% of people having regular episodes, with male and females both being affected equally. This phenomena generally lasts no more than a few minutes. However, whilst one night some people will have multiple episodes, some others may only have one single occurrence. Sleep paralysis is a state during waking up or falling asleep in which a person is conscious but in a complete state of full body paralysis. During an episode of this paralysis, one may hallucinate by hearing, feeling or seeing things that are not there, which often results in total fear for the one experiencing it. This sleep paralysis phenomena has been described in many ways throughout the history books. It is believed to have played a role in the creation of many stories, such as alien abduction and several other paranormal events. Greetings, unexplainers. Thank you once again for giving up your valuable sleeping or napping time by tuning in and listening to this episode of Mark's Unexplained World. My name is Mark Hughes. I'm a psychic medium, a ufologist, and a man who will often go out of his way to feel abnormal. In this episode, I'm going to tell you about the perplexing story surrounding that old hag called sleep paralysis. And this week's necessary disclaimer. This is an episode that involves sleep disorders and nightmares. So may cause you to experience your very own sleep paralysis old hag. So you listen at your own discretion. Also, all opinions and comments are strictly my own. But the facts still remain. And again, I also apologise if I pronounce anything incorrectly. You know, I often wonder whether I am actually asleep when I write these shows, or if it is my old hag who is writing them for me. But to be honest, who can tell? Anyway, let's wake up and get on with this week's episode. According to the NHS website, sleep paralysis is when you cannot move or speak as you are either waking up or falling asleep. It can be quite scary, but it is harmless, and most people will only get it once or twice in their lifetime. During sleep paralysis, you may feel awake, but you cannot move, speak or open your eyes. You may also get the feeling that someone is in your room or that something is pushing you back down. And along with that, you may also get that feeling of fear. However, these feelings only last up for several minutes. This is because you are still in sleep mode, but your brain has woken up and is now active. Sleep paralysis incidents have been recorded both in writing and in medical texts throughout history, with various types of interpretations and assumptions around its cause. 
The Chinese, at around 400 BCE, wrote about strange experiences while dreaming, which makes this Chinese text the first detailed experience of sleep paralysis recorded. Come forward a few hundred years, and in 1664, the Dutch physician Isbrand van Dijmerbroek wrote a collection of case histories in a book called Of the Nightmare. Isbrand van Dijmerbroek describes in his book the nightly experiences of a 50-year-old woman with hypnagogic hallucinations. Isbrand van Dijmerbroek also found that sleep paralysis appeared to occur more frequently in people sleeping on their backs. This collection of texts is the first detailed record of sleep paralysis with hypnagogic hallucinations. And on our first interesting side note for this podcast, hypnagogic hallucinations are vivid, visual, auditory, tactile or even kinetic perceptions that, like sleep paralysis, occur during the transition between wakefulness and REM sleep. Examples include a sensation of impending threat, feelings of suffocation and sensations of floating, spinning or falling. Hypnagogic hallucinations occur in 40 to 80% of patients with narcolepsy and cataplexy. These are easy to distinguish from the hallucinations occurring in psychiatric disease because patients with narcolepsy usually recognise the events as not real. Psychiatric hallucinations can occur at any time of day, whereas hypnagogic hallucinations usually occur around the sleep period, either just before or after. I'll talk about uh, narcolepsy a little bit more later on in part two of this podcast. Fast forward uh, another few hundred years... And in 1977, tragically, 100 healthy people died in their sleep from unexplained nocturnal death syndrome throughout the Southeast Asian communities, with the majority of them being Loatia Humong men. The men in question showed no underlying causes, except that they experienced higher rates of sleep paralysis and had all expressed their belief in their imaginations from their nightmares. Unexplained nocturnal death syndrome, or Brugada syndrome, is an inherited channelopathy, channelopathy that's it, associated with increased risk of serious arrhythmic events, such as ventricular arrhythmia and cardiac arrest. A couple of years later, in 1979, sleep paralysis was recognised as a formal diagnosis by the American Academy of Sleep Medicine Diagnostic Classifications of Sleep and Arousal Disorder. Now there's a name to contend with. Move forward a few more years again, and in 1993, it was revealed that people with both bipolar disorder and or schizophrenia had higher instances of sleep atonia due to stress and fatigue. So very briefly here, sleep atonia is when there is a brief loss of muscle control that happens just after falling asleep or before waking up. In 1999, a full study found that up to 20% of students were discovered to be affected by sleep paralysis, which peaked at around the age of 30. The study also found that 32% of psychiatric patients have at least one sleep paralysis episode in their lives. And in 2013, the cases of sleep paralysis increased up to 65% in a group of Cambodian refugees who had all, sorry, who all had post-traumatic stress disorder, or PTSD. The increased sleep paralysis rate suggested that the refugees were suffering from stress, 
fatigue, sleep deprivation and trauma, which could have caused the increase in their individual sleep atonia. After this first short break, in part two, we will look at the science, the symptoms and some of the types of hallucinations that have been linked to sleep paralysis. This show is brought to you courtesy of Neil Packer and the Haunted Antiques Paranormal Research Centre. Find them online at www.hauntedresearchcentre.com or at 9211 Regent Street, Hinkley, LE10 1AW. Open on Saturdays from 10am to 4pm for guided tours of the haunted rooms at just £3 per person. Booking is essential at all times and over 16s only please unless accompanied by an adult. The haunted rooms are extremely haunted and paranormal activity could and has taken place at any time. Some areas and particular objects or items can be quite scary and unnerving. Membership is available for £25 to qualify for selective offers. And why not download the app available on both iOS and Android for only three ninety nine to keep up to date with what is coming up at the centre. The pathophysiology, or the study of changes in the way the body works that result from the disease of sleep paralysis, have not been precisely identified although there are several theories out there about its cause. The first of these sleep paralysis theories stems from the understanding that it is a parasomnia or part of a group of sleeping disorders that result from a dysfunctional overlap of the REM and waking stages of sleep. And another interesting side note, as I guess most of you are probably aware already aware, REM is an abbreviation of rapid eye movement. REM sleep is the fourth stage of the sleep cycle, marked by the rapid eye movements, muscle, relaxation and increased brain activity. It usually occurs about 90 minutes after falling asleep and accounts for up to 25% of one's total sleep time. Okay, so in part one, I did a brief history of sleep paralysis. Now it's time for the sciencey bit, so please pay attention. In a multi parameter study of sleep or polysomnographic studies, they have found that in individuals who experience sleep paralysis, they have shorter or fragmented REM sleep in, uh, in latencies. Sorry. This study also supports the overlap that a disturbance of regular sleeping patterns can precipitate an episode of sleep paralysis. Mainly because fragmentation of REM sleep commonly occurs when one's sleep patterns are disrupted. Another theory is that the neural functions that regulate sleep are out of balance so much so that it causes different sleep states to overlap. And as a result of this overlap, the cells capable of sending the signals that would allow for complete arousal from the sleep state have difficulty in overcoming the signals sent by the cells that keep the brain in the sleep state. So during normal REM sleep, 
the threshold for a stimulus to cause arousal is greatly elevated. In individuals who report to suffer with sleep paralysis, there is almost no blocking of any exogenous stimuli, which means it is much easier for a stimulus to arouse the individual. Exogenous stimuli are external stimuli without a conscious intent. The best example of this is the attention drawn to a flashing bulb in periphery vision. The vestibular nuclei, or the nerve located in the brainstem, is particular, in particular, sorry, has been identified as being closely related to dreaming during the REM stages of sleep. And according to this hypothesis, the vestibular motor disorientation, unlike hallucinations, arise from a completely indigenous source of stimuli which means the characteristics of REM sleep are retained upon awakening. As the correlation with REM sleep suggests, the paralysis is not complete. The use of an EOG trace shows that eye movement is still possible during sleep paralysis episodes. However, the individual experiencing sleep paralysis is unable to speak. On a quick interesting side note here, an EOG or electrocoreography is a technique for measuring the cornea, sorry, do that one again, measuring the cornea retinal standing potential that exists between the front and back of the human eye. The most common consequences of sleep paralysis include headaches, muscle pains or weakness and paranoia. There have been several types of hallucinations that have been linked to the sleep paralysis phenomena. These include the, the belief that there is an intruder in the room, the feeling of a dark presence and the sensation of floating, to name but a few. One very common hallucination is the presence of the incubus or succubus. An incubus being the male demon who is said to have sexual intercourse with sleeping women. And the succubus who is the female demon who is said to have sexual intercourse with sleeping men. There are some cultures who claim that this demon is gender neutral, but please don't get me started on that one. The intruder and the incubus succubus hallucination phenomena highly correlate with one and another and moderately correlate with the third hallucination, which is the vestibular motor disorientation, which in layman's terms means out of body experience. This experience completely differs from the incubus succubus phenomena. And on another interesting side note, an out-of-body experience, otherwise known as OBE or OOBE, is a phenomena in which a person perceives the world from a location outside of their physical body. An OBE is a form of autos autoscopy, which literally means seeing self. Although this term is much more commonly used to refer to the pathological condition of seeing a second self or doppelganger. A neurological hypothesis is that in sleep paralysis, the cerebellum, which usually coordinates body movement and provides information on body position, experiences a brief myo clonic spike in brain activity, inducing a floating sensation. The sleeping paralysis phenomena is usually experienced equally in both males and females. Time for some number crunching, I think. <clears throat> According to the figures that I found on Wikipedia, lifetime prevalence rates derived from 35 aggregated studies 
indicate that approximately 8% of the general population, that is 28% of students and 32% of psychiatric patients, all experienced at least one episode of sleep paralysis at some point during their lives. Rates of recurrent sleep paralysis are not as well known. However, it is generally thought that 15% to 45% of those with a lifetime history of sleep paralysis may meet diagnostic criteria for recurrent isolated sleep paralysis episodes. In surveys from Canada, China, England, Japan and Nigeria, 20% to 60% of the individuals reported having experienced sleep paralysis at least once in their lifetime. And in general, non-whites appear to experience sleep paralysis at much higher rates than whites, but the magnitude of the difference is actually rather small. Approximately 36% of the general population that experiences isolated sleep paralysis said they developed it between the ages of 25 and 44. With isolated sleep paralysis being commonly seen in patients that have been diagnosed with narcolepsy. On an interesting side note, narcolepsy is a rare long-term brain condition that can prevent a person from choosing when to wake or sleep. It is often caused by a lack of the brain chemical which regulates wakefulness, known as hypocretin and also known as orexin. The lack of sorry the, the one again. The lack of hypocretin is thought to be caused by the immune system mistaking the attacking the cells that produce it or the receptors that allow it to work. The exact course of narcolepsy is often unclear, and as things currently stand, there is no cure for it. But making changes to improve your sleeping habits and taking certain medicines can help minimise the impact the condition has on your daily life. Approximately 30 to 50% of people that have been diagnosed with narcolepsy have actually experienced sleep paralysis as an auxiliary symptom, with a majority of the individuals only having sporadic episodes that only occur between once a month to once a year. And only 3% of individuals experience experiencing sleep paralysis that is not associated with, neuro, with a neuromuscular disorder have regular nightly episodes. Sorry about that. In the book, A Dictionary of the English Language, the, f the original full definition of sleep paralysis was codified as a nightmare, a term that has now been evolved into our modern definition. And a short interesting side note, the book, A Dictionary of the English Language, that is sometimes published as Johnson's Dictionary, was published on the 15th of April 1755 and written by Samuel Johnson, who was sometimes known as Dr. Johnson. It is amongst the most influential dictionaries in the history of the English language. And at that time, it was thought that sleep paralysis was widely considered the work of demons, and more specifically, incubi, which were thought to sit on the chests of, this, of the sleepers. After this second short break, in part three, we will look at the folklore and the many names and cultures that the sleep paralysis phenomena go under. Fright Nights was established in 1999 as the first company in the world to offer overnight ghost hunt experiences to the general public, pioneering paranormal events since the last century. Fright Nights operate at hundreds of the UK's most haunted and exclusive venues. All events have their own team of experienced paranormal investigators, mediums and psychics. They have a VIP members club for regular returning guests, offering loyalty discounts and exclusive invitation only events. They can also host private events for your family and friends. 
You can contact them on 07 852 998 628 or email them at office at frightnights.co.uk or take a look at their website at www.frightnights.co.uk where you can see the many locations they investigate and learn about them and the opportunities they have available. Hundreds of ghost hunters join Fright Nights every month for the most thrilling ghost hunting experiences they'll never forget. If you haven't been on a ghost hunt before, then why not join them to see what it's all about? Why not visit their social media sites for up-to-date information on all the places they visit and to see what's coming up in the future? They look forward to seeing you all soon. Fright Nights Ghost Hunting Events. Remember, only the original will do. The main symptom of sleep paralysis is being unable to move or speak whilst being awake. Also, during this phenomena, you can imagine sounds such as humming, hissing, static, zapping and buzzing noises. Other sounds you can also experience include voices, whispering and roars. It has also been known that during an episode you may feel pressure on the chest and an intense pain in the head. These symptoms are usually accompanied by intense emotions such as fear or panic. People have also had sensations of being dragged out of bed or that they are flying or have a numbness and feelings of electric tingles or vibrations running through their body. Sleep paralysis may also include hallucinations such as an intruder, presence or dark figure in the room. Although the core features of sleep paralysis appear to be universal, the ways in which they are experienced vary according to the time, place and culture, with there being over 100 terms that have been identified to explain these experiences. Some scientists have proposed that sleep paralysis is an explanation for reports of various experiences of paranormal and spiritual phenomena, such as ghosts, alien visits, demons or demonic possession and alien abduction experiences. Other names also include the shadow people and the night hag, or as I was always told, the old hag. According to a few scientists, culture may be a major factor in shaping the sleep paralysis phenomena. When sleep paralysis is interpreted through a particular cultural theater, uh, filter, sorry, it may take on a greater quality of being particularly noticeable or important. For example, if the sleep paralysis phenomena are feared in a certain culture, this fear could lead to a conditioned fear and thus worsen the experience, which in turn leads to higher rates of the condition. With me so far? Good. To back up this theory, it has been recorded that much higher rates and longer durations of immobility during sleep paralysis have been found in Egypt, where there have been many more elaborate beliefs about the sleep paralysis phenomena involving the malevolent spirit-like creature known as the Jinn. And on an interesting side note, the Jinn, also known as the Jinn or angelicized as genies, are invisible creatures in early religion in pre-Islamic Arabia and later in Islamic culture and beliefs. Although generally invisible, Jinn are supposed to be composed of thin and supple bodies that can change at will. They favour a snake form, but can also choose to appear as scorpions, lizards or as humans. 
They may even engage in sexual affairs with humans and produce offspring. If they are injured by someone, they usually seek revenge or possess the assailant's body, refusing to leave it until forced to do so by exorcism. Jin do not usually meddle in human affairs, preferring to live with their own kind in tribes similar to those of the pre-Islamic Arabia. Individual jinn appear on charms and talismans. They are called upon for both protection and magical aid. Many people who believe in jinn wear amulets to protect themselves against the assaults of jinn, sent out by sorcerers and witches. A commonly held belief maintains that jinn cannot hurt someone who wears something with the name of God written on it. Research has found that in Egypt, sleep paralysis is associated with great fear and the fear of impending death in at least 50% of sufferers. A study comparing rates and characteristics of sleep paralysis between Egypt and Denmark found that the sleep paralysis phenomena is three times more common in Egypt than it is in Denmark. In Denmark, there are no elaborate supernatural beliefs about sleep paralysis, and the experience is often interpreted as an odd physiological event, with overall shorter sleep paralysis episodes, with only 17% of people fearing that they could die from it. In Scandinavian folklore, the sleep paralysis phenomena is caused by a mare, which is a supernatural creature related to the aforementioned incubus and or succubus. This mare is said to be a damned woman who has been cursed with her body being carried around mysteriously during sleep and without her noticing. In this state, the damned woman visits each villager to sit on their chests while they are asleep, causing them to experience nightmares. In Nigeria, isolated sleep paralysis, otherwise known as ISP, appears to be far more common among the African descent population than among the whites or Nigerian Africans. The African communities often describe the sleep paralysis entity as the devil on your back. Meanwhile, in Thailand, it is believed that sleep paralysis and discomfort are caused by the ghost of the Thai folklore known as Phi Am, with some people claiming that this spirit may even cause bruises. On an interesting side note, the Phi Am is a ghost who is said to sit on the chests of people whilst they sleep, causing discomfort and even death. According to a few websites, the best way to fight them off or deter them is to put on lipstick because apparently the Fi'am doesn't attack women, and those who believe in her existence put on lipstick before sleep, sorry, put on lipstick before sleeping to trick the Fi'am into thinking they're female. In Kurdish culture, the sleep paralysis phenomena is often referred to as motoka, motaka, it is believed to be a, a demon that attacks people in their sleep, with children of a young age being of particular interest. It comes into the bedrooms and steals their breath away as they sleep and breathe heavily. In Iceland, the folk culture sleep sorry, I'll do that one again. In Iceland, the folk culture sleep paralysis phenomena are generally known as having a Mara. A Mara is a goblin, or since it is generally thought to be of female origin, a succubus, which is believed to be the cause of these nightmares. A very quick interesting side bit here, the origin of the word nightmare itself is derived from the English cognate of the name Mara. 
other European cultures share variants of the same Icelandic folklore calling Mara under different names. There are many, many different names, myths and cultures around the world surrounding the sleep paralysis phenomena. And although they all have different tags, they all seem to represent the same fear, dread and misunderstanding as to what it actually is. During my research, I could find not I could not find one clear reason as to why this phenomena occurs. So I think it is reasonably safe to presume that there is no clear reason as to why this phenomena occurs. However, I can tell you that sleep paralysis does happen. And when it does, it is usually linked with things like insomnia, uh, disrupted sleep patterns, perhaps due to shift work or jet lag. The aforementioned narcolepsy, which, if you remember, is the long-term condition that causes a person to suddenly fall asleep at any time, day or night. Post-traumatic stress disorder, otherwise known as PTSD. Generalised anxiety disorder, or a panic disorder, or an inherent, inherent family history of the sleep paralysis phenomena. According to the NHS website, here are a list of things you can do to help prevent you from suffering from sleep paralysis. They suggest that maybe you can prevent this phenomena by changing your sleeping habits, by trying to get a regular seven to nine hour sleep in any 24 hour period, or perhaps uh, go to bed at roughly the same time each night and get up the same time each morning. They also recommend that you should get regular exercise, however, not in the four hours directly before going to bed. If you do suffer from sleep paralysis, a general practitioner may be able to treat any underlying condition that could be triggering this phenomena, such as the aforementioned insomnia or post-traumatic stress disorder. If this does not help, the GP might refer you to a doctor who specialises in sleep conditions. And, if this is the case, then the treatment you get from the specialist is that he might give you medicines that are usually used to treat depression. Taking this type of medicine at a much lower dose can help prevent sleep paralysis. The specialist may also refer you for Cognitive Behavioural Therapy, or CBT. And on the last bit of uh, interesting side note of this episode of Mark's Unexplained World, Cognitive Behavioural Therapy, or CBT, is a talking therapy that can help you manage your problems by changing the way you think and behave. It is most used to treat anxiety and depression, but can be very useful for other mental, physical health problems. And on that note, I wish you all good night and pleasant dreams. Thank you all for taking the time out to listen to this episode of Mark's Unexplained World. In our next episode, show 78, we are going to be looking at the Kofu UFO. Kofu is located between the cities of Nagoya and Tokyo, and it is the capital city of the Yamanashi Prefecture in Japan. Kofu was also the site of an alien encounter of the third kind. The event was witnessed by two local little boys who not only claimed that they saw two UFOs, but they also encountered a strange, terrifying alien. It was an encounter they will never forget. This show was written and researched by myself, Mark Hughes, and proofread and edited by Linda Hughes. The actors in this episode were Mark Hughes, Linda Hughes and Denise Pooler. 
with special thanks to Neil Packer and the staff at the Haunted Antiques Paranormal Research Centre in Hinkley. And a big thanks to everyone for listening. Mark's Unexplained World, because there's more to the paranormal than meets the third eye. And remember guys, keep it real, because being real is better than being perfect. This show and all its contents are covered by basic copyright of Mark the Medium.